Good stuff, good stuff. Welcome for those of you that are new to church. If this is your first time ever in church, then hopefully we are being a good representation of what church is and how it, how it goes. Um, I think we are. We're so far so good. Yeah, okay, cool, 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 lovely, wonderful, wonderful. Um, I'm going to read a bit of the Bible. Uh, we are in a series which young Adrian has devised for us uh, up here in Birchwood, because Adrian's leading our Birchwood church this month, and, and he really wanted to do a series on Easter leading up to next week, which is Easter Sunday. Who knew that next week was Easter Sunday? Okay, a ah, few you know that stuff. Okay, so for those of you who maybe are very new to the faith or don't have any faith, um, or maybe those of you who just have faith but don't really know much about it, let me tell you that Easter Sunday is the one day of the year when every Christian should be at church, really, right? Because it is like the sort of the almost like the showpiece of the Christian faith. Easter Sunday is the day that we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and uh, and uh, and a fact. Of that is that without his resurrection, like we said in the song and like we sang in the song, without his resurrection, we don't get resurrected. So if you are a Christian who doesn't believe in the resurrection, then you don't believe you're going to go to heaven. Crazy, right? Yeah. Okay, that is crazy. Because if... Yo. <laughs> yes, Darren. Thank you, Gene. Um, yeah, so if you're a Christian who doesn't believe in the resurrection, then that means that you're a Christian who doesn't believe that you yourself will go to heaven. And so next week is literally like the big one. So if you're not planning to be in church next week, then change your plans because next week is a week that you should be in church. Okay, is that cool? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on. Okay. We're in Matthew chapter 27 for those of you who'd like to read along. And it's part of the Easter story that I'm reading out today. And, uh, and we're going to go into a little bit of a, I'm going to teach you a little bit about this guy. Is that all right? You up for it? And then after I've taught you a little bit about this guy, I'm going to give everyone in the room an opportunity to respond to the words that I'm saying. Because like I say, I believe the words that I'm speaking are spirit. I believe that God is speaking through me to you. And so if you're not a follower of Jesus today, I'm hoping you will be by the end of the next three hours of me talking. Okay? <laughs> Lovely. I'm so glad some of you guys are listening. I meant 20 minutes. Um, I will speak for about 20 minutes and then I will give you an opportunity if you do not follow Jesus. I will give you an opportunity to follow him because I think that it will change your life for the better. Um, I personally have seen life change so much because of Jesus. I have been healed on the inside of my heart and I've been healed on the outside of my heart. My body is strong. I'm not sure whether you can tell, uh, but I am fit, bro. I am a gym bro and I'm strong and I'm, I'm healthy and I'm good. I've got a lovely family. I own a house and I come off an estate a lot like this. I'm a minister. I'm just about to finish my master's degree because Jesus saved me from being a little bit not interested in that stuff. He saved me from the world outside of this place. A place where I was struggling so much with so many different things, mostly because of a traumatic childhood, which I'm sure a lot of people in here can relate to. But Jesus can save me from that, and I was one of the worst. So if he can do it for me, he can do it for you. So in about 20 minutes, 18 minutes... I'll give you the opportunity, if you haven't already, to follow Jesus. Is that good news? Amen. Come on, okay. So I said all that just so you could all find Matthew 27 in your Bibles. You, you got it? Cool, lovely, yeah. That's cool, lovely. For those of you who don't have a Bible, don't feel ashamed because you can have a little look on your phone. You can type it on Google, Matthew 27, and we're going to go from verse, let's have a look. We'll go from verse uh, 11, okay? And, um, and then what we're going to do is, uh, after I've read it, I'm going to explain it. Is that all right? We good? Okay. So, here we go. Jesus, before Pilate, it says here, uh, and it says, Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor questioned him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said to him, It is as you say. And while he was being accused by the chief priests and the elders, he did not answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not 
hear how many things they testify against you. And he, and he did not answer him with regard to every single charge. So the governor was quite amazed. Interestingly, can I just point out that in all of the different versions of this, all, all of the different versions of this, like because this is recorded a few times in the Bible, they all say that he was amazed. Random, isn't it? Just a random thought. Anyway, um, now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the people any one prisoner whom they wanted, okay? So uh, the big feast, like their Passover, which is like our Easter, you know, the one big thing that all Jews must attend, okay? Um, the Passover, because it was so massive in their history, okay? Um, at that particular feast, the governor, who was Roman, had a custom of essentially letting one of their prisoners go. Yeah, you all get it? Cool. At that time... They were holding a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. Okay? Barabbas. Let's all say Barabbas. Barabbas. Yes. Have you all heard of Barabbas? Some of you guys have heard of Barabbas. He's a very famous name in the Bible uh, because of what you're about to hear in a few moments. So when the people gathered together, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you? Barabbas or Jesus? Who you call the Christ. Okay? For he knew that because of envy, they had handed him over. Okay, So the religious leaders of the time were a bit jealous of Jesus. They didn't like that he was getting so famous, and so they handed him over to be killed by the Romans. Okay, While he was sitting on a judgment seat, his wife sent a message to him saying, have nothing to do with, the, with that righteous man, for last night I suffered greatly in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas. And to put Jesus to death. Crazy, right? So Jesus is a good guy who goes around healing folks. Barabbas is a notorious guy. Like the notorious B.I.G., you know, like he's a bad guy. He's probably a rapper, probably had loads of money and smoked loads of weed. Um, <laughs> Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? They all said, Crucify him. And he said, why? What evil has he done? But they kept shouting all the more, saying, crucify him. When Pilate saw that he was accomplishing nothing, but rather that a riot was starting, he took water and he washed his hands in front of the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man, that is Jesus' blood. See that you, uh, see that yourselves, sorry. And all the people said, his blood shall be on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas for them. But after having Jesus scourged, he handed him over to be crucified. Okay? So, who is Barabbas? So we can read here that he is notorious. In some of the versions of this scripture, uh, like, like I say, this is recorded a few times by a few different people. Okay? So, in some of the versions, it says that he was a murderer. That he had uh, that he'd killed people. It says that he was essentially an insurrectionist. Do you guys know what an insurrectionist is? Um, I think uh, I think we're, we're, we might see a bit of an insurrection coming up, no doubt, soon if, the, if if our government don't do something to help us out a little bit, you know. But um, but um, but an insurrectionist essentially is someone who rises up against the government, who rises up against their rulers and their leaders. And so in this moment, what you see is a guy who is known for murder. He's known for stealing. He's known for like going against his leaders and his government. And he is a bad guy, all-round bad guy. In fact, some of you guys who know, uh, who know the Bible well, you might say that actually he was sort of what the Jews were expecting Jesus to be. So he was sort of what the Jews were expecting Jesus to be. So some Jews thought that the Messiah would come and he would be like, you know, overthrow the Romans and, and kill them and wipe them out of the land and all that sort of stuff, which... which this guy was trying his hardest to do. So it might be that they just got a bit confused and they, shout, they thought that Barabbas was the Messiah. You know, Maybe they thought that. As it happens, actually, in Matthew's version, you don't have it in your Bible, but, but in there, uh, in the original text, Barabbas is his second name. His first name is also Jesus. So it's Jesus bar Barabbas, right? Do you know what else I found out as well as I digged into this? Do you know what Barabbas means? Son of the Father. 
So his actual name was Jesus, son of the father. And then these folks all chose the false Jesus instead of the, the proper Jesus to be the most... I know, it's crazy, isn't it? I know, I know Christians in the room were like, poof, mine equals blown, right? But for those of you who probably don't know the fullness of what that means, something that you can learn today is that Barabbas, the bad guy, the insurrectionist, the murderer, the thief, was also a son of the father. Was also a son of the father. And you might feel like you are so far off from where God wants you that there's no way that he can possibly love you. But the truth is that he considers you to be a son or daughter of the father. Just like Barabbas. And just like Barabbas, we've all gone and done our own thing. We've all decided that, you know, we know best. We know what's best for our own lives. We all decide at some point that we, uh, we think that our, um, our idea of how to make money is the best. You know, anyone good at making money? No, no, no. I can tell. Um, just by the way you're dressed. Um, no, I, 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 I kid, I said that at Paul because I knew he wouldn't take offence. Um, <laughs> uh, but but it's, it's true, isn't it, that all of us have chosen. The Bible literally says that every single person has chosen to walk away from God. It says that we all are like sheep that have gone astray. And because you've gone astray, you might feel like there's no way, no way that God is on your side and that he cares for you. But I'm a dad. Luckily, both of my children are quite well behaved um, because I, I read the Bible a lot. And so my Bible says, you know, like spare the rod to pull the child. So my kids are really well behaved. Um, our kid, obviously. Um, Paul is not impressed by that. Um, I'm kidding. Um, but, <laughs> but the truth is that as a father, I know that if my son or daughter were to go their own way and do their own thing, that although I might not necessarily agree with their lifestyle choices, I would still love them, right? Yeah? I might think they're absolute muppets, but I'd still love them. Yeah? So I would love for my son Liam to be a pastor. I would love for him to do that. I'd love him to, to jump up and preach a gospel every week and see hundreds of people come to faith all the time. I'd love that. But right now, he's being a mechanic. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with being a mechanic at all. But he has chosen his own way that is separate to the way that I would personally like to go. But does that mean I stop loving him? No, it doesn't. In the same way, God, even though you feel that you've gone the wrong way, and you actually might have gone the wrong way big time, right? Even though you've gone a different way to where he would want you, he doesn't stop loving you. Why? Because you are a son or daughter of the Father. It says we're all his children. In fact, there's another story in the Bible. You guys must have heard of the story of the, the, the guy who had a dad and then uh, his dad was like rich and he had a brother as well. And, and, uh, and then essentially what happens is the young lad's just like, hey, you know, I want to go out and live my own life. I want to do my own thing. And so he, he, he says, dad, can I just have my part of the inheritance now? And so, uh, and so dad goes, fine, 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 fine. Quit bugging me, right? Who knows that kids keep on asking for money all the time, right? Come on. Yeah, we know that. And so he's like, Dad, I need my money. I want my money now. Dad, I want my money. And so his dad gives him his inheritance and he goes off and it says that he squandered everything. You know, just like used up all of the cash and stuff that dad gave him. And it says that he ended up so poor and so broke that he ended up eating the husks that pigs would eat. So basically, eating with pigs out of a trough because life has gone so far away from where daddy wants it to be, right? Because you know, back at home, back at home, he had a royal robe. But back at home, he had all the food he needed. Back at home, he had servants to serve him. Like, dad wanted so much more for him, but instead, he chose his own way and ends up feeling like he's just surviving on the dregs of society. Does anyone else feel like that from time to time? I'm just surviving 
on the dregs of society. It feels like I have nothing. I've got nowhere to go. I've got nothing to give. I've got nothing to receive. No one wants to give to me. I try my hardest sometimes to find ways of making cash. I even try getting a job, but for some weird reason, for some weird reason, I just can't make it stick. I can't make it work. And I feel like I'm surviving on the husks that have been left by pigs. Right? Anyone else feel like that? Man, that's where I was. Like, what, 15 years ago? Actually, sort of. In all honesty, I was doing all right. I had, I had my own business. I was, I was like running my own business. I was working hard. I was just about to buy three houses. But at the same time, it felt like, although I had lots of material wealth, I didn't have much emotional wealth. And so it felt like I was surviving on the emotional husks of society. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. And so I did lots of things to try and overcome that, that emptiness. I would fill it with my things were cocaine and pills, you know. I used to like uh, the drugs that made me feel excitable. I know you're thinking, man, he doesn't need any more excitement in his life, if you know me well at all. But I felt that's what I needed. And so I took loads and loads of substances. At one point, I remember maybe two or three months before I actually become a Christian, I, I was like, for a friend, I would ship... Forty thousand pounds worth of cocaine across town in my car, and then, and then I would like just it'd go, ego have a few lines as a as a little thank you. And so I used to just be a donkey, just having a few lines for, for sh- shipping around cocaine. It's crazy, isn't it? And so even though I was doing really well in life, I was like free cocaine, can't complain of that. Yeah, sure, I'd, I'd take your rucksack from one end of the town to the other. <laughs> you hear what I'm saying? But I was so lost, so broken, so. So poor in my emotions. So poor in my spirit. I didn't have any spiritual well-being. And maybe today you might feel the same way. Pastor, I've never opened the book. I've never read the Bible. I've never had it feed me. I've never felt it feed me. Has anyone never felt this thing feed you? You know? Because this thing is life. It feeds you. It's really interesting. Justine, do you mind me mentioning something you said this week? Um, Justine came in this week, and uh, she wasn't sure whether it was the right time to be baptized. And, and, so, uh, and so she said, oh, I'm not sure whether it's the right time. And then she came in a few days later, and she said, uh, she said I don't know why, but I think there's some, I feel like I've gone a, a step back. It feel, I feel like something's missing. I feel like something's... Something's gone wrong on the inside. It feels like I took a step back from where God was leading me, right? Was that a good representation of what you said? Yeah. Truth is that we were on a journey and Justine started off with some scripture and the Alpha course and started from there and started getting fed, not just physically, although we fed you physically as well. Um, But she was fed spiritually, and the truth is that right now, some of you guys, even as I say this, you can feel the hunger pangs of your spirit on the inside. Can anyone feel that? It feels a bit like I'm missing something. I am hungry in some way. I've had my Weetabix, but I still feel hungry. Right? Anyone feel like that? Because that is your spirit crying out to God like, Feed me, feed me, feed me. These words that I'm speaking right now will feel like a little bit of nourishment. And you know when someone's been starving for ages and ages and ages. My wife used to work in an eating disorders ward. And in an eating disorders ward, the body gets to a place where it starts like basically not, not eating. It stops being hungry because, because you've starved it so bad. And then as soon as it gets a little bit of nourishment... It starts to feel them hungers, that hunger again, you know, because, because whilst you're starving, it loses its appetite. But as soon as you give it a little bit of food, it starts regenerating the feeling of hunger. And so it is with your spirit as you stand here today, as you sit here today, as we sing these songs and, and God fills the atmosphere and your spirit is starting to be fed. Suddenly, as I'm speaking, you notice 
this feeling. Man, I'm hungry. Almost might feel like your heart is about to beat out of your chest. I know that feeling. I've been there before. And God is here right now just saying, I want your back, son. I want your back, daughter. In that story, it's called the prodigal son. The son suddenly realizes he's made a huge mistake and he decides he's going to go back home and he, he thinks of a letter that he's going to write to his dad. He thinks of all the words he's going to say. He's, he's like, starts writing his postcard, you know, send it ahead of me, uh, all that sort of stuff. And, and, and he starts thinking about and he gets this thought in his head. I'm going to go back to him and say, I'm really sorry. I know I had it all together when I was with you. I had life and life and all of its fullness when I was with you. And I was foolish and I was stupid. But I just want to come back home, Dad. And the Bible says this, Jesus said, that as the father saw his son from afar off, he runs towards him, which, by the way, is very unkempt in Jewish culture. Real men don't run in Jewish culture, but, but daddy sees his son coming from afar, and boy, does he run. Runs up to him and embraces him and didn't even get his words out, but he gives him his robe back and he gives him his life back and he gives him everything he wants, everything he's ever needed. And today, like Barabbas, maybe you're a son or daughter of the father who has gone your own way and done your own thing. And God is here right now calling you back. That is all. God is here right now calling you back. And so, I promise 20 minutes. Been about 20 minutes, haven't I? I've done good. Especially if you know me. Normally I preach for an hour. <laughs> I preach for a long time normally, don't I? But now we've got to that point where I ask you the question, Right? Do you feel like the son or daughter who's ran away? Do you feel like Barabbas who has the title son of the father or daughter of the father but is nowhere near what he should be doing? Do you feel like that? Do you feel like you've left something behind? Do you feel a sense of spiritual hunger? Do you want to respond to that? Mm. Interesting. Um, so, interesting. It felt as though I had spiritual hands on my head. What during worship? Is that right? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. yeah. Mm. Mm. It's interesting, right? Um, by the way, God often does some weird and funky stuff in church. That's one of them. Um, I once felt an arm of God around my shoulder once in the little youth centre down there, which is like, in your, like, if you see it, you think, how can someone do church in there? It's so small. But I was worshipping all by myself. I know, actually, I think Liam was with me and a couple of other guys. And, uh, and I felt an arm come around my shoulder, and I turned around to ask Liam what he wanted, and there was no one there. And I was like, whoa, what's that going on? Anyway, I think what I'm hearing you say is that God is here, right? Yeah. And so, I'm going to invite our friend Danny to come and help us in this moment. Because we all know that when the keys are played, you know, Jesus turns up even more. I kid, obviously. But it does help us. I'm wondering whether you want to close your eyes for a moment. Because um, I really feel like, uh, and, and you know, when I, when I ask you, when I ask you the big question, and I say, now's the time to respond, I don't... I don't want you to be shy. I don't want you to like um, shy away from what God is doing right now. Because I really feel like God wants to uh, wants to save some of you folks, like He saved me, like He uh, like He saved 
Barabbas, funnily enough. Like, how crazy is it that God literally let his own son go to the cross and then Barabbas walks free, even though Barabbas has done loads of stuff wrong, right? That's crazy, isn't it? And so today, Jesus, once again, because Jesus is timeless, because his word is timeless, Jesus today is literally there going, I'm willing to go to the cross so that you can walk free. And the question is, who wants to be free? Who wants to be free? If today you want to be free, you want to follow Jesus, because the Bible says that if we have a relationship with Jesus, it says that we will go to heaven. It means that our life will start to change. Who knows that when you hang out with people who struggle with drugs, you end up struggling with drugs, right? Yeah? Who knows that when you hang out with people who are investment bankers and have loads of cash, you end up with loads of cash, right? That's actually the truth, by the way. When you hang out with people, you start to become like them. You get the same as what they've got going on. Adrian, when you hang out with Preacher Dazza, guess what happens? You end up being a preacher, right? Yeah? When you hang out with Jesus, when you hang out with Jesus... You start to receive what Jesus has in heaven. The Bible says that he is the king of heaven and he rules it. It says that he has everything. It says that there is no weeping in heaven. There is no tears in heaven. It says that the temperature stays at a perfect 21.5 degrees. The entire No, I'm kidding. It doesn't. But it does actually say that the temperature never changes. It says the sun never goes down. Did you know that? There is no darkness in heaven. And maybe some of you guys today feel like you're in a right dark place. Nothing's going right. When did it start going wrong? Ah, oh, you know what? When I put my finger on it, it's when I left church. When did everything start going wrong? You know what? It's when I stopped reading my Bible. And then everyone goes, oh, I didn't really start. Well, more for you. Come on. And so the call today is this. Do you want to follow Jesus? Do you want to live in his freedom? Do you want to be like Barabbas and be set free and live at the price of Jesus today? Because that's the reality of it. Do you want that? And with my heart in my mouth, I issue a call. If you want that, I want you to stand. Yeah. Come on. If you want that freedom, I want you to stand. If you want to follow Jesus, I want you to stand. If you want a relationship with God, I want you to stand. And if you're too chicken to stand and you really want to, if you've been feeling what I've been saying you've been feeling, then stop being chicken. Get on your feet. I'll give one more opportunity. If you want to be set free and to live with Jesus, stand now. Yeah. Yeah. And heaven is in uproar, the Bible says. It says that heaven has a party for everyone who chooses to follow Jesus. And so with so many people standing up, it's like heaven's going to be partying all for the rest of the day. I know, woo, indeed. Woo, indeed. And so, let's pray. If you're one of those people standing and you're saying, I want to be free then pray this prayer with me. Jesus, I understand that I am a son or daughter of God. I understand that I have walked away. And that today you've offered me the chance to come back. Jesus, 
I accept your offer. Maybe you want to say it out loud. Jesus, I accept your offer. Make me free. Make me whole. Amen.